something that I learned early on in my life is that it is very possible to grieve the living. I lost my cousin, Jessica, in two, September in 2006, but I lost her way before that. I lost her about 18 months before that to addiction. She wasn't herself anymore. So you grieve twice. You grieve for the loss of the person that you remember that you spent your whole life with. And then you grieve the actual body when, when, when they're gone, gone. So I let families, I try to let families know that you will go through the, what is it? The, the stages of grief before God forbid they even succumb to their addiction. And then you'll go through it again. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. On today's episode of the Share Podcast, we have Alicia Cook joining us. Alicia is a writer from New Jersey whose work has been published all over the tri-state area in a variety of student and university magazines, as well as in online publications like the Huffington Post, CNN, USA Today, and other Gannett publications. Her series, The Other Side of Addiction, has captured a worldwide readership. And although she is not a drug addict herself, her life was directly affected by addiction when she lost her cousin, Jessica Cook, in 2006 to a heroin overdose. Join us now as Alicia takes us through The Other Side of Addiction, as a family member who was caught in the crossfire of this deadly disease. But first, if you would like to know the best way to show your support for the Share Podcast, here are a few ways you can help. First, go to www.thesharepodcast.com, and there you can sign up for our free newsletter, which will let you know every time a new episode of the Share Podcast comes out. You can leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. If you would like to know other places that you can listen to the Share Podcast, you can listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. If you would like to donate to the Share Podcast, you can do so via PayPal, or you can support us on Patreon. We have a thriving Facebook group that grows daily and has massive participation. Again, it's a private group, so if you would like to discuss recovery, share your experience, strength, and hope, help others or lean on others for support, be sure to join the Facebook private group. And all of this information can be found on the website. So go to the website, and there you will find all the information that you need to help support the show. So now a quick message from our sponsors, and on to the show. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www.sobernation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. And finally, would you like to receive the most popular AA daily devotions free in one distribution? Transitions Daily delivers daily devotions from the 24 hours a day, AA thought for the day, daily reflections, big book quote, just for today, as Bill sees it, plus more. You can get our distribution daily via email, private Facebook group, or Twitter. Go to daily aaemails.com for more information. And don't forget to share dailyaaemails.com with friends in meetings and with sponsees in recovery. Now back to the show. Hey Alicia, thanks for joining us. Hey O, thanks for having me. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling okay. How are you? <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good. You ready <laughs> to get started? Yeah, let's do this. All right, perfect. All right, folks, today we have Alicia Cook joining us on the Share Podcast. She's a writer, and she writes on the other side of addiction. In other words, how addiction directly affects the family and loved ones of the addict. Her articles are read and shared by tens of thousands. She writes for the Huffington Post and Gannett on topics of addiction and also regularly shares other people's stories on how they were touched by addiction. And her website is the Alicia Cook. Dot com. So, Alicia, thanks again for joining us. I'm excited to have you. 
Thank you. And let's talk a little bit because, uh, like we were talking prior to the interview, uh, you're not actually an addict. You're not addicted to any substance. Um, but your journey began because you had a loved one that had an addiction. Tell us a little bit about that relationship. Sure. Um, my cousin was addicted to heroin and ultimately overdosed and died almost 10 years ago when we were 19. Wow. Um, she was my first cousin. We have a very small family, so everyone was very close. Um, this was in 2006 um, when Jess died. She battled addiction for roughly 18 months, we estimate. Jess was the opposite of the stereotypic drug addict. She had a 10 p.m. curfew and always made it home on time. She grew up with her parents and grandmother and two si siblings and living in the same home together. And it was a true home with holidays and family parties and lots of laughter. And Jess had the loudest laugh of them all. She was <laughs> truly a happy person. So when this happened, when our world was turned upside down, I, I couldn't believe it. And yes, I have never used a drug myself. I've never been addicted. I, I don't speak on what it's like to be addicted to a substance, but I do speak regularly and loudly on what it's like to love someone who's battling addiction, to have someone in your family or in your heart and just watch them deteriorate every single day. I don't, I don't really think it's codependency or I don't be, you don't become addicted to loving them because you love them from the beginning. It's more of, I speak on the helplessness and the stages of grief that loved ones go through watching someone just deteriorate right in front of their eyes. Right. And you were 19 years old at the time. Yes. Jess and I are, um, well, we were 10 months apart and eerily now I'm, I'm 10 years older, but Jess, battled addiction and lost when she was 19. It was September 2006. So we're right around the 10 year mark now. And so what was it? I'm sure that you had to go through your own process of grieving through, through losing your cousin. Um, how long was it before you decided that you were going to become an advocate for, for family members who have gone through what you're going through right now? It wasn't immediate because I know we're going to go back to it, but um, I had to grieve and I had to wrap my head around what had happened. And I was very young when it happened. Um, I had a lot of learning to do. I know a lot of people right away, they want to, you know, put on their armor and, and go to battle. But I really wanted to educate myself on addiction, specifically on heroin. I wanted to, to really engross myself in any knowledge I could get before I went out there to, to fight the good fight. So it took some time. I didn't even write about my cousin, and I'm a writer. I didn't even write about my cousin for about six years after her death. It, it took me about six years to even put pen to paper and write how I was feeling. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's just jump into that then. Tell us about, because that's a six-year span of time. So that's, that's a significant amount of grieving. What is it exactly that you went through that you can explain to the other listeners, you know, to kind of prepare them for these types of challenges or situations that present themselves, especially when a loved one dies of an overdose? Oh, when a loved one dies of an overdose, you, um, it's the call you always expect you're going to get. Mm. But you, when you get it, you're still just as shocked because you know that they're killing themselves ultimately. And you know that what they're doing every day is life, or life and death when they use. But when you get that call, your whole world stops, even if you could see it coming. Um, that six year span, it was it was a mixture. It was me growing up since I was only you know 19 at the time and, and now I'm 30. It was me growing up. It was me going through college, still going through the motions it was me grieving and it was me learning, educating myself on addiction. And in that time, I, I was able to really, I think, hone my voice and find my voice. And I knew right away, once this heroin epidemic ignited again, um, I knew right away that I was going to try to be a voice for the families. And something that I learned early on in my life is that it is very possible to grieve the living. I lost my cousin, Jessica, in two, September in 2006, but I lost her way before that. I lost her about 18 months before that to addiction. 
she wasn't herself anymore. So you grieve twice. You grieve for the loss of the person that you remember that you spent your whole life with. And then you grieve the actual body when, when, when they're gone, gone. So I let families, I try to let families know that you will go through the, what is it? The, the stages of grief before God forbid they even succumb to their addiction and then you'll go through it again. So is this what you do right now? The, the Alicia cook, uh, com website, is this something you do full time? Is it something, for example, like the share podcast is something that I, is a service that, that I provide because, you know, after going through what I went through, I feel that it's so important to share the stories of addicts uh, that have gone through this particular process in their lives, so, you know, the, the wreckage it caused in their lives, their rock bottom moment, and then their journey into recovery. And this, you know, this is in, in order to inspire others to do the same, to, to give them hope that there is a possibility to leave that that lifestyle of addiction and adopt a new way of life. It's not what I do full time. You know, I have my, you know, my regular job. But is this something that you've managed to do full time to, to become a, a writer on this aspect? Or do you have another secular business or, or, or work that you do that pays the bills? Well, I am compensated now um, for my work in addiction. However, I donate 100 percent of the pro- proceeds to help families where addiction is present. So I don't make a penny off of my advocacy, but I do have a full-time job. I am a writer. I write full-time. I write full-time. Um, I'm in PR and private college in New Jersey. And so I do write full-time, but I joke around now and say I have two full-time jobs because <laughs> I literally never stop. I go to my full-time job and then I work another you know, five or six hours a day on the other side of addiction and reaching out to families and returning emails. Um, as my readership has grown, I get, you know, tons of emails a day from strangers. And I know that these are people that feel very alone who maybe just found out someone they loved is using or, you know, God forbid they lost someone. And I, I know that feeling of being alone and not knowing where to turn and to, you know, going on the internet and finding everything, but nothing at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, because of that, because of that solidarity I have with these families going through this now, I, I spend time and respond personally to every single email I get. Now, I was 10 months older than Jess, like I said, 10 months older than Jess, and now I'm 10 years older. But I was around 17 years old when heroin and drug use started to lose their stigma to me. Not, not that it became accepted, of course, but I understood addiction from an early age because of my cousin. I lost my ignorance to all of this at a very young age, and, and in a way, it made me more understanding and compassionate as an adult as I continued to learn about addiction. Right. And it was hard to learn about. Like how I said, you, you could find everything and nothing on, on the Internet. It was hard to learn about addiction, especially back when I wanted to learn about it. I couldn't find anything in bookstores and self-help sections on what I was going through. The, the non-addict who needed to know more about the why outside scientific rambles and overwritten memoirs and everything like that. Correct. Right. Like it's, it's just so much. And uh, I realized what I wanted to read honest words from families who had been there in the trenches didn't really exist. Um, and by the time I was 20, my, my cousin was dead. So I said to myself, maybe I could be that voice and fill that void. And I've been using my writing to where to raise awareness about drug addiction and help others cope with the same issues ever since. Beautiful, beautiful. So what is your daily routine look like today? I know you're you know, obviously you're super busy. I understand that super busyness, but there's a balance that we all have to maintain in our lives, you know? So what is your daily routine look like as far as, you know, working out or, you know, different projects that you're working on or hobbies, you know, how do you maintain a, a balance in your life? It's hard. It's hard to, to maintain <laughs> balance, um, especially because I want, I, I want to, I know it's a advantageous thing to say, but I want to make the world a better place. And I feel like there's, there's no rest when, when you want to do that. But I do have days where I say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to check my email today. I'm not going to talk about heroin today. I have to actually say that out loud some days. 
and focus on other things. But I love the beach and I love spending time with my family and I love, I, lo- I do write about other things. I write prose about relationships and things like that. So that, that kind of gives me a mental break from all the darkness I'm usually surrounded by. But yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm not, I'm not the poster child for, for a balanced <laughs> life. I love the honesty. I love yeah, the honesty. I, That's good. I work around the clock. Um, I'm focused that, that drive that, yeah that my drive comes from a very humble and honest place because of my, the trauma I've experienced. So I feel like that kind of keeps me level in its own right. But yeah, I, I'm just really just nonstop. Right, right, right. Well, Especially we're filming a documentary now. So, um, PBS is following me around and chronicling my efforts to combat the, the heroin epidemic. And that episode is going to air in September, I think. So well, it's just really just been round the clock. Okay. Well, the, let's not gloss over that. G- give us, you know, expand upon what's going on right now with that. Cause that's a big deal. Uh, so tell us about exactly how that works. Okay. So my addiction series is called the other side of addiction and it's been read by people all over the world. Um, I say the other side because addiction is a family disease. It, it rarely just affects one singular person. And writing has always been an outlet for me. And because of the internet, as, as great, I mean, as, as frustrating as social media can be at times, it really is a great tool and it helps connect people that might not otherwise have been connected. And um, the PBS documentary series, Here's the Story, it's called. The show's creator and producer, Steve Rogers, found me on social media and he had been trying to find an avenue to document the heroin epidemic specifically in my state of New Jersey, but he hadn't been directly touched by it. And he was still waiting for that vessel, that guide, um, to be able to tell the story of our state and what's happening to our people, um, our youth. Um, right now heroin's killing four people a day on average in my state, maybe more where you are. I'm not sure. Um, So he reached out to me and he said, hey, I work for PBS. I do this show. It's Emmy nominated. It's been on since 2010 and I want you to be on it. Would you be interested in us following you around and and seeing what you do on a daily basis to help families where addiction is present? And I said, sure. (laughs) Not really knowing what I what I signed up to do. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I'm still I'm still so green. I was just like, yeah, I'll do this. And then I started talking to people and they were like, you're going to film a PBS documentary. And then I realized how, how many documentaries and how many, I think this show's broadcast in over 2 million households. It's going to stream online. It's going to be everywhere. And I kind of didn't know what I was doing (laughs) when, when I signed on, but I, I like how it's coming out. We're still filming. We have about, I think one full day left to shoot. And, um, I don't know if you've seen any of the documentaries on the heroin epidemic that are out there now. Yes, I have. Uh, I I recently interviewed uh, Katrina King. She was mm -hmm. part of the documentary Chasing the Dragon. Yes. So, yes, I I, and and I'm I'm very familiar and and, uh, on exactly what's happening out there as far as the accessibility to prescription drugs, you know, Mm -hmm. just just the the rampant abuse. And yeah, no, just it's a catastrophe. It is. It's truly a crisis. And, and I revisit that a lot in the documentary where, you know, because a, a long I'm, I work as a, I act as a guide in this documentary where, yes, I share my story. But more importantly, the people I have met along the way that are willing to share their stories with me, I reconnect with them in person. Um, so on this journey of this episode, I speak with local government officials police, retired police, um, addicts in long-term recovery. I'm talking like 30 years who now own, you know, run and operate their own rehabilitation centers. I talked to an aspiring singer who, whose, uh, immediate family member is currently in the throes of a, a really bad heroin addiction. I speak with just, um, owners of the Willow Tree Center, which, I guess we'll backtrack, but the book I released in January, all my proceeds are going to the Willow Tree Center. They ran the first ever uh, grief group strictly for parents who lost a child to addiction. Um, So I really, we touched on a lot of aspects, but I asked you if you're 
familiar with documentaries on this epidemic because I do feel like our documentary when it airs will be different. I, I hope not for worse, <laughs> but it's, it's going to be different because most documentaries on the heroin epidemic I've seen from popular cable or movie networks all look the same. Uh huh. Statistics anyone could Google pop up along the screen throughout. And yes, there are, they are really dark, scary statistics, but it's not new information. They show the loved ones in some stage nor an on meeting talking about how their kids did sports. And then they show the users, but not with much understanding of who they were before addiction took over their life. So you do not connect with them at all. They remain one dimensional and they all show the addicts using, heating up the spoon, exposing the vein, shooting up. I think the tendency for ratings and sensationalism is to maybe capture the addict doing that, to see yes. them using, to see them at their worst. Absolutely. Uh, right? Like, I feel like it's a bit of a sideshow, like a, a morbid curiosity for those who never use that drug. Sometimes I even think networks hope to scare others into not using. And if that's what they're really trying to do, then they don't understand this disease at all. Scare tactics are not prevention or intervention for that matter. So our documentary, I hope, comes across like how I envisioned. It's shot through the eyes of the loved ones, the non-users who love or lost someone due to addiction. The heroin epidemic just isn't about border control, the cartel, the police, big pharma. The heroin epidemic isn't even just about the user. It's more far-reaching than that, more damaging than that. And I hope that I am expressing that correctly in the documentary because the one thing I learned, I mean, I've learned a lot, but the one thing I, I really learned is that Drug addiction changes makeups of families and courses of lives forever. Um, we're here and we still love them, even though there's still that stigma out there saying we should just, quote, let them die or the whole, like, they did it to themselves. It was a choice thing. So, and even more importantly, mo so many families still do not realize what they could do for themselves to heal themselves. No matter what, we still need to go on with our lives. And man many families don't even know what they could do legally to help the addict in their lives. So I know that was a lot, but um, <laughs> that's that's really what the documentary right. encompasses. It, it's not your, it's not what you're used to seeing. There will be no needles. There will be no addicts shooting up. I, we could have easily have put a call out and could have gotten that on film. But like I said, the epidemic is more than just watching someone use drugs. Why are they using drugs? Right. What's happening to the family? What's the family doing? So this is just truly shot through the eyes of people who really really care and it's going to be called what's the the name of the documentary is is called here's the story yes it's called here's the story it was previously called driving jersey but now they've expanded to other states so now it's called here's the story and um I, it might be one of the first episodes of the new season and is it is it one segment for two hours long or is it a various like there, kind of like a series I mean, we're still that's a good question. I, I wish I knew the answer to that. We're, we're still shooting. Um, we're, we're not even in post-production yet. So um, um, it's definitely going to be at least an hour, whether they make it a two hour, you know, a two episode, half hour each segment. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to make it one hour long segment. I don't know what, what they're doing, but Steve Rogers has been so great. And I've learned so much from him and he's really going to, he's really going to see this through and it's going to be great. I love it. I love it. Um, I couldn't agree with you more on so many different points about what you're trying to accomplish in this particular documentary. I'm one of those people that hates that show Intervention because, oh my God. because of everything you just described. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, I'm, I'm a drug addict. Okay. I, I, you know, I may have 13 years clean, but I'm still a drug addict and there's things that trigger me. And so when I watch these, you know, I've watched probably two episodes um, and I'm done, right? That, that's, that was, that's it for me. You know, watching someone inject themselves, so watching someone smoke crack, watching someone do these things to themselves, and then watching the whole family dynamic. It's, it's almost as though there's, it's less about, you know, getting clean, all right, and how to get clean than 
this dramatic sensationalism that you talk about. I, I totally agree that that is what they're trying to capture because that's what the ratings are all about. The ratings are all about the shock value. It's all about seeing something that if you're not an addict, this is not something that you're accustomed to. So you get to, to see this sort of real life uh, tragedy. But for me, it was, it was something that as an addict sickened me and where I can see certain individuals not only either getting sickened by it, but it's also a trigger. Watching yes. somebody use it, yep. it evokes feelings and emotions and almost a sense of urgency to act out. I mean, I, I couldn't, I mean, I can't imagine, but I, I, I would think so. Same with any disease, eating disorders, anything like that. There are, there are trigger warnings that should be put in place that aren't because, yeah, I mean, we're on the same page with that. It's definitely, they try to do it for scare tactics, which is, will never work or for ratings and I mean, if you've seen one person shoot up, you've seen everyone shoot up. So why do you have to play it over and over and over again and not investigate why they're using in the first place? Yes. It, it, for me, and it's a, again, it's all about, it, it's all a matter of opinion. It's a hugely popular and successful show. It's amazing how, you know, the ratings and the, the popularity of that show, uh, I couldn't connect with it, me personally. So, I applaud your efforts to go in another direction, to, to take this in, in, in the direction that's it's more on the aspect of getting to know the person that they were before. Because the reality is that once somebody uses a drug, once somebody uses an opiate, especially some, something like Oxycontin, they're almost, you know, in many cases, they're addicted right in that instant, right at that moment. The minute they take that first pill, the body connects with it. And if you've got an addictive tendency, you're off to the races. And mm -hmm. so the idea, as far as I'm concerned, is to get to it way before it ever gets there, right? To, to understand that the possibility of you using, if you have an addictive personality, chances are the minute you take this drug that you're going to be addicted to it. Absolutely. And um, another part of the documentary that I forgot to mention is I went and spoke to a packed auditorium of students at a high, at the high school in New Jersey that my cousin attended up until she died. She was still attending classes. She had straight A's up until she wasn't, you know? Um, so I speak directly to them and I say, you know, I'm not here to preach to you. You might be, you might be using right now. You might, you definitely know someone that does. There's no one that's not affected by this epidemic anymore. But you will not beat this substance. You will never beat an opiate. Like you said, you said you're in recovery 13 years. We, you still consider yourself an addict and there's triggers. You're never the same person ever again. So I tell them, you know, if you use this drug, it's not a matter of if you will die. It's a matter of when you will die if you don't find recovery. And it is so hard. I applaud you for being clean 13 years. It is so hard to, to find recovery. Recovery is an everyday decision for, for someone who's addicted. They have to wake up every day the rest of their lives and decide not to use drugs. And, yes, uh, yes, yes. But it, it goes, it goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond that because there's a lot of work that, that we do, um, as addicts that, you know, especially in the beginnings stages that, that help us because, you know, the, the idea of being so consumed with addiction, being especially an opiate, you know, something, you know, crystal meth, anything that is, that is these powerful drugs that are so all, so that are so all consuming, right? It's so important to connect yourself with other individuals that have battled this, that can walk you through this. I, I wouldn't have been able to, to maintain you know, my sobriety f all this time, if I hadn't, you know, jumped into a 12 step fellowship and surrounded myself with other individuals that were going through what I was going through by myself on, you know, there's no way I'm, at least for me, there's no way I could have done this alone. So, you know, I'm grateful for that time, but I also know the, the, the amount of work that it took, um, especially in those first couple years 
just to get over that hump of that of that uh the mindset the triggers the the obsession the compulsiveness there's so many aspects of it you really need help to get through it i mean i'm so i'm so glad that that you took the necessary steps that you wanted more for yourself um i always think about you know my cousin jessica wasn't using long you know, there, there's people that have been using years. Jessica was under two years. And, and I always wonder if she had more time, you know, would she have been able to get it together? And I'd like to think yes, you know, but unfortunately that wasn't her way. And then you said something that stuck with me because no one accomplishes anything alone. And that's absolutely right in all aspects of life. And then you said that you found strength and help through other individuals that battle addiction. And for me, I could say the same thing. I I found help and healing and a solidarity with other individuals that battle addiction as well. But for me, it was on the other side of it, the the, the loved ones that that went through it, because um, you you have a feeling of you're not alone. And and anyway, that's basically what the documentary is. And we're just trying to give a new spin on it because so many people have been touched by addiction, and I just want it a documentary that kind of showed what happens because addiction has collateral damage and the collateral damage in addiction are the loved ones. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, another aspect to recovery for us is it's, it's a spiritual connection, uh, a connection with a, with a higher power. Um, do you have a regular practice, uh, meditation? Do you have a, a connection with a higher power? Um, that you rely on to help you also get through, you know, this, this, um, the, you know, you know, through life in general. <laughs> I mean, my, my two living guideposts are my parents. They, they've gone through so much and have helped me through so much regarding this epidemic, but, um, I believe in God and, and I, I ebb and flow with how much I believe. Um, but I do believe that, that I believe in God. I was raised Catholic. I, I have, I have my faith. I believe that Jess is no longer in pain, but I also believe that she's not just in the ground. I believe she's at, in a better place. And, um, my, where I go to really level out and kind of you know, go through my thoughts and everything. I find peace at the ocean. I grew up at the Jersey shore. So I guess that's like my form of meditation is I just sit silently by the ocean and just reflect. I think for many of us, there is, there is such a need to disconnect from all of it. And especially with such hectic schedules, we're so busy. I got so mm-hmm. much going on. Uh, you know, I, I still have a sponsor all these years later, wow. and I and I'm going through, you know, some some challenges uh, business wise right now. Uh, so of course, I go to him, and it's like I'm super stressed out. I've got all this stuff going on. It's got nothing to do with me picking up a drink or a drug. It's got nothing to do with, you know, the old me. Uh, it's got to do with the new me, right? And how do I cope with these, you know, super stressful situations, right? And of course, the, he's like, well, are you praying and meditating in the morning, right? And it's like, uh, okay, yeah. There is a basic fundamental structure or routine that we adopt or that we teach people that are first brand new into recovery. And it's, okay, get up in the morning, you pray, do a little meditation, Okay. Um, make sure that you eat, you know, three, four times throughout the day. Don't be hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Make sure you're getting plenty of rest. And, you know, 13 years later, it's almost like I need him to tell me that again. Cause when I get stressed, then all of a sudden I'm not eating regularly. I'm not Mm -hmm. resting like I should. My head is spinning like crazy. Oh, I forgot to do this. Oh, I got to do that. Oh, I didn't. Oh my God. I got to remember to do this. So I wake up in the morning in a panic. Right. And so I need that quiet time. Uh, This morning I did that. Right. Like this morning I was able to get up for 20 minutes, do a little prayer, do a little meditating. And I and no matter what's going on in my life, there's never a moment where that doesn't help, where I'm not able to kind of put the brakes on, 
you know, the craziness that's going on in my life and reconnect. I don't know if you, if, if that's something that you've ever, you know, adopted, you know, like a, a meditative practice. I, I should, um, (laughs) I really only slow down when I burn out and I know it's not the healthiest. I I do skip meals at times. I mean, I'm being, I'm an, I'm, I'm honest. I, I'm being honest with you. Um, please. I'm so focused on my next move sometimes that, you know, I do have to step back and, and certain things calm me and bring me back to reality. You know, like when I'm driving and the sun's setting, that calms me down because I don't know, I love sunsets. I love oceans. Um, I watch almost like robotically when I really want to de- you know, disconnect. Um, Gilmore Girls on Netflix. I probably know, I probably know the, the episodes by heart, but it's just something that I don't need to concentrate on. It's like mindless at this point. Yes. Yes. I can Um, totally relate to that too. But I do, I do want, I bought a yoga mat, didn't start yoga. You know, there's things that I want to do that um, I'm hoping once this documentary wraps that I'll, I'll be able to kind of refocus my energy in a more calm place for a little bit because um, my next book's not scheduled to come out for a while. And I will have some downtime. I do go on vacation. Um, this year I was in Turks and Caicos and Aruba. I'll be going to Europe in the fall. So I do make time for my, my life life, but it's just so important. Everything that you're doing right now with this podcast, stuff that I'm doing, stuff other advocates are doing, it's just so important that I feel sometimes like, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to that, that sometimes you don't want to slow down because you know, you're making a difference. Yes. Yes. No. And, and trust me, this is a great, this is a great segue, right? This, cause what we do is so important, right? But this is a great segue for everyone that's listening because it's so important, um, to be mindful. You have to be mindful of everything that's going on. And when you're going a hundred miles an hour, when you hit the wall, it's, it's going to hurt a mm-hmm. lot more than when you're going five miles an hour. And so that, that need to kind of remind yourself and to also learn from others. I, you know, this is not something that I adopted by myself or discovered on my own. This is constant repetition and constant reminding from the people that are the closest to me. My wife, especially. My wife's the one that's going, okay, you're, you're doing way too much. Have you gone to a meeting? Have you called your sponsor? Right. Have you done any meditating? Did you go to the gym? Like that has nothing to do with the podcast. Zero. All right. right. And so and so it's always that kind of a reminder that, hey, you have to take care of yourself, because if you don't, then, you know, at some point it's going to implode on you. Right. So I, I think it's very important. And I in, uh, and, and Alicia, do, we appreciate your honesty. You know, the, uh, there's so many people that that want to put this image out there that they're bulletproof and they've got (laughs) everything under control and they're doing everything right. And there's nobody that's doing everything right. Nobody. Especially not me. (laughs) (laughs) So it's good. Even having this conversation is something that at some point it it kind of will, will, you know, plant a seed, you know, for both of us to kind of always be mindful that we have to take good care of ourselves drink plenty of water, get plenty of rest, eat the right kind of foods, eat plenty of raw f- food. You know, even if you're not a raw foodist, you should be eating, you know, a certain amount of raw food every day. You know, um, you know, all these, all these aspects are important. Um, you know, one thing that I do want to do though, because you did mention something about the documentary or n- not so much the documentary, but you know, when you go and speak, um, at schools or to, to kids, uh, you share, you said you share your story. Right. Right. It, is it the story of you and your cousin? Uh, yes, actually. And um, when we're done here, I could send you, I believe one of the speeches I gave at the high school was transcribed and published on the Huffington Post. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could send you that. But I speak when I was at my cousin's school, I speak on behalf. I speak twice. Once I go up and I say blatantly, and and people have heard me say it before, especially if they follow my work, heroin is the worst thing to ever happen to me, and I've never touched it. And usually I have their attention once I say that. (laughs) You have my attention. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So 
you gotta you gotta laugh, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> I I open with that because heroin is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Heroin is the worst thing that you know, God willing, will be the only like be the worst thing the rest of my life that ever happens to me. You know, barring any other traumatic events, unforeseen. But I've never touched it. So I just want, it's important, especially kids at that age, to know, like, your choices affect others and they affect you, maybe for life. You said it earlier that, you know, opiates rewire your brain. You may never be the same. And um, I just open with that message saying, you know, you're, if you feel, if you love someone suffering from addiction and you feel alone, you're not alone. You're a member of a club no one wants to be really a part of. But there's a lot of us out there that love someone that's struggling or has struggled with addiction. My main thing is I want to break the stigma. I want families to speak out because public opinion sways public policy. And if we want any kind of real change, we need to start speaking out. And luckily, you know, it seems that there's been a shift and families have become more vocal, even in their own kids' obituaries. I have parents that send me their kids' obituaries and they're heartbreaking, but right in it, they don't gloss over it anymore. They say, so-and-so lost their ba- their battle with addiction. And um, I think it's important to let people feel less alone. So my first part of the speech at the high school is usually about that. You know, if you love someone, if you're affected by addiction, you're not alone. You know, it's okay to feel guilty. It's not, it, do not feel guilty. It's okay to feel mad. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to laugh at times still, even if you're going through this, you know, you'll have another thing I say all the time is you'll have bad days and, and good days, but never normal days ever again. And you know, that's okay. Um, and then the second part, yes, I, I speak directly about my relationship with my cousin. We were very close. We, we had the same similar, you know, same color hair. Um, we, we resembled each other. You could tell we were related and we had a lot of similar interests from Broadway to sushi to certain music. And, um, she was a really good friend of mine and it's unfortunate. I only had that little bit of time with her, but I'm also grateful for it. And I speak something that I speak on now, which I never spoke about the first time my aunt and uncle, her own parents knew about it was when I, when I spoke out loud about it was, um, I share our last conversation and our last conversation was right before she went to rehab for the last time. And then ultimately she ended up getting kicked out of rehab and overdosing and dying. Um, I'm one of two of the last family members and friends to speak with her while she was alive. And I share that conversation and, um, can you share she that? Con- why don't you? Why don't you? Uh, well, here's what I'd like to do. Uh-huh. I would actually like to hear your story that you share about you and your cousin, because the the share podcast is about stories. You know, that's you know the the statistics is one thing, but they like to know what happened to you, right? So, what can you give us that story about your relationship with your sister? I mean, with your cousin leading up until that last message? Sure. Um, Jess was one of my first friends. <laughs> I met her when she was born in March in 1987, just 10 months after me. They had a lot of the same interests from music to poetry to really anything artistic. We loved the same food, like anything with buffalo sauce and sushi. We laughed together, cried over boys together, complained about our parents together. <laughs> <laughs> Um, her father and my father are brothers. We we grew up together, and I did love her until the very end. And I've been told I was one of the last people to speak to Jessica right before her last day in rehab and her death. And I've shared with my readers countless times our last words because her last words to me were "See you later, cuz." She always called me cousin instead of cousin or right. Alicia. Mm-hmm. Her last words were "See you later," and I believe she meant it. And even in the throes of her addiction, I believe she really thought we would see each other again, but we didn't. The last time I saw her, she was in a funeral home. So what I've never shared before recently is our last conversation in full. Her parents didn't even know what we talked about the last two hours we shared together. And um, I wanted to keep it to myself for a few reasons. But now, 10 years later, and with the epidemic the worst it's ever been, I thought it was important to share it. with her parents and with, I guess, ultimately the world. 
Um, it was summer in, I think it was July, 2006, late July. And I, and I was still in my bathrobe. I remember that. I remember when my mother told my aunt Cindy that, I'm sorry. I said, I, I remember when my mother told me that aunt Cindy, who was Jess's mom and Jess were coming over. Um, I was mad because I had to cancel plans with my friends <laughs> and spend the day with my cousin in the house. And I knew at the time she was still actively using and she was talking about going back to rehab, but she didn't really go back to rehab yet. Um, I was 20 and I was naive and I didn't want to see Jessica. Um, I didn't understand the, the disease like I do now. All I really knew was that she was really hurting my aunt and uncle and all of us. It was it, it, the effect that it was having was starting to really weigh on all of us. Right. So, I remember I was just, I was as a naive protest, I was not going to take change out of my bathrobe. I know it's silly now, but that's, <laughs> that's where my mind was at. Um, they showed up not too long after my mom said they were going to, and she was in a long sleeve hoodie and it was 90 degrees out. So yeah. I became even more annoyed, you know, and I decided I wasn't going to get dressed right then and there for sure. So she wouldn't want to leave the house. And we hugged hello. And then just the two of us went into my family room, my parents' family room. And uh, it's hard, as I'm sure you know, it's hard having small talk with a heroin addict. Because all you want to do most of the time is shake them and, and yell at them and try to fix them. Yeah. But I, I tried, you know. And, and then she said to me, she looked right at me and she said to me, I might not make this, I might not make it out of this alive. Oh, man. This was the first time she ever brought up her addiction without sounding defensive or arrogant. Before that, she would talk about it like it was the cool thing, like she was in like she was in control. Right. She was never vulnerable in front of me, probably because we were the same age and she wanted to still seem like, you know, the cool cousin. <laughs> but she said to me, I might not make it out of this alive. And, and she sounded scared. And then I naively responded, no, no, you can just stop using. It's simple. Just stop. You know, in hindsight, I know you can't just stop now, but, um, she insisted that it wasn't that simple. She went into, she went into detail what it was like to get dope sick and to go through withdrawal, which again was, I hadn't known about that up until then. Um, and even then, even though I felt the compassion creeping in, I, you know, I told her, you know, you're killing your parents. And she told me that she knew she was killing them. She knew she was killing me. She knew she was killing her siblings. And then she said, Alicia, I'm killing myself. It's so much stronger than me. I wish I never tried it. Yeah, there it is. And, and this was just as open as she was going to get with me. And um, she said she went in and she said she was going to try to go to rehab again. She told me she was going to try her hardest, start working out, get her mind in a better place again. But she didn't seem hopeful. Even even when I was, you know, nineteen or twenty at the time, I was I saw something behind her eyes that she just seemed beaten, you know, aged and, and it was sad. And then our mothers called her up for upstairs for lunch. And then we went back downstairs and back then we had um I don't um you remember MySpace? Yes, I do. Vaguely. Her, yes. Her <laughs> her and I had MySpace, so um we played on our MySpace pages and then Jess opened up again. And she said, um, she was almost reflective. And she said, we had so much fun together. Right. And I honestly felt like she was saying goodbye to me. Yeah. So then I switched roles and I tried to be hopeful and I said, yes, but we could still get back there. We have our whole lives. We have so many more memories we can make. You'll beat this. And then she said, well, if I don't make it out of this, can you write about it? Don't forget me. Oh man. And I get chills now even, yeah. even remembering it because I've, I've been writing since I was eight years old and writing Jess was a writer too, actually, you know, poems and things like that. But I've been writing regularly since I was eight years old. So Jess knew that my skill set was there and, and she just said, if I don't make it out, write about it. And then she made me pinky promise her that I would. And it took some time. Like I told you earlier, it took six, six years for me to write about it. But I began to write about her and our experience as she wished. Um, and unknowingly, because her mother just found out about this last conversation we had, um, 
the last couple of years, my aunt, every time I write something about Jessica, about who she used to be, so we remember the person she was, um, my aunt always says that she lives in fear that people will forget how good of a person Jessica was before addiction took over. So unknowingly, her words have been echoed by her own mother. Yeah, and then not long after she told me to write about it, we hugged and she said, see you later, cuz, and she was gone. Wow. And, uh, Powerful. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's that's something I did not share with people for 10 years. I kept that to myself. Um, I can't speak for an addict because I'm not an addict, but maybe you could enlighten me a little bit. When when it gets that dark, when when you when an addict either thinks they're going to die or hopes they die, do you think like a part of them knows that they won't make it out? Like how Jess said? Absolutely. Yes. There is a there is this there is this darkness, there is this ominous feeling of evil that surrounds you. Um for those of us that either uh anticipate death, wish for death or contemplate suicide. Those are the three, uh, you know, d- different, I guess, feelings or, or, or just you, you, a feeling of acceptance almost that the end is near. Uh, I remember praying for death. I remember praying cause I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop using. And like she said, I might not make it, I might not make it out alive. Right. Mm-hmm. There is this once it's got you. Once it's got you in its grips, it is it is virtually impossible to get out of its clutches alone. And so if you don't know what your next move is going to be, then your anticipation is just death. It's the wor- it's the most it's the hor- most horrific feeling on the planet, you know, and I have I have been there. I have been there. So many of us have been there. Um, and the sad thing is that like for her and also in myself, there's hope, right? At that particular instance, in that moment, she was still alive, which means she could have still made it. It was that last, it was that last hit she took, right? It was that, that I'm, I'm, I'm assuming she died of an overdose. Yes. Yes. She overdosed. She was clean for almost six weeks. So her, um, She did go on and go to rehab and she did start working out and she was very positive according to her parents who had visited her. Um, But again, it's just, it's something so powerful. I'll never be able to understand Mm. it because I'm never in those shoes. But um, she was clean for, I believe, about six weeks. So her tolerance was way low. Yes, that's the problem. Yep. There it is right there. It's, don't, don't beat yourself up about understanding it. Us addicts don't understand it. Who, who is to understand the overwhelming uh, power of this disease, that powerlessness that you feel? And when you stop using for a, con- a considerable amount of time, your mindset doesn't change. Your addiction does not change. The only thing that changed is that you allowed your body to detoxify for a while. But the minute you pick up again, you go back to the same dosage that you were using prior to stopping um, and chances are you'll kick it up a notch. So it's not like you start out with a beer, right? You're going to immediately go to the, to what you used to use. If you're going to go, if you're going to use, you're going to go right back to the same amount, but your body and your heart is not ready to take that dosage anymore. And so in many cases, that's where the overdose happens. There's absolute, there's always hope. And for anyone that's listening, uh, either a, a family member that's listening or an addict that's currently using, the next, the next time you use could be your last. But if you're still alive, then there's absolutely hope that you can, that you can recover. But you have to reach out for help. You have to ask some, you have to first of all admit that you have a problem. And then second, you have to ask for help. And that's the, that's the, if you take away everything else at the base, at, at, at just the base, at the basics of how to, how to stop, that's it. That's your first steps before you do anything else is you have to admit that you have a problem and you have to ask for help. And from that moment on, if you do that, 
then there's a really good possibility that you're going to get through this thing. Right, because your your core support system, if you're lucky, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't go to rock bottom and, and you're not completely alone, your core support system is there and they will help you. And and that's the family and that's your loved ones and you know, they want as a loved one, I want my the people that I love to get better. And I will do anything in my power to make sure that I'm doing, I'm doing my part to, to help them, you know, find recovery. Absolutely. And so, there's, um, what you said is your, your last, you said something, you said that your next bag could be your last. And a pr- I don't know if it's a prayer. It, it floats around the internet, but something that, something that really sticks to me with me is this, um, I, I, I use it almost as a prayer and it's what I do today is important because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. Yes. And that's how I live. And that's how I know um, a lot of people in recovery are living. And that's really my mantra. And that's probably why I don't slow down too, because (laughs) if today's my last day, I was on a podcast talking about things that matter. You know, I wasn't wasting my time. Um, I want to make sure everything I do each day matters because you never know who needs to hear what you're saying right when you're saying it. Yeah. Tony Robbins live with purpose and passion. <laughs> yes, I definitely do. <laughs> so what is there, is there one specific message that you'd like to get out to our listeners? That whether they are battling addiction in recovery, family members of it, of people suffering from addiction, you're not alone and every voice matters because like I said, you, you never know who needs to hear your story and, um, your story could save someone else's, you know, Jess didn't make it, but me sharing her story and in turn other experiences I've had may have saved other people. Absolutely. Speak up. Like Don't it. be ashamed. There's there's no shame in addiction. There's no shame in loving an addict. It's it's all antiquated stereotypes, and and I do feel a shift that you know the stigma is lessening because so many people are affected. You, you can't walk down the street without without bumping into someone who's directly affected by addiction. So there's no shame, and uh, we're human. You know, one choice could, shouldn't dictate the rest of your life, but sometimes it does. And um, you're human and you're not perfect. No one is. I agree. The The veil of shame behind addiction has been lifted over the last few years. Uh, speaking about being an addict, admitting that you're an addict, asking for help no longer carries the veil of shame that it used to. Um, and people don't look at you as though you have some sort of like you're a leper. Uh, right. It's It's a lot more of... I know someone who can help you. There's so many people now that can say, I think I know someone that can help you than ever before. And it's, it's only because of the efforts that, that we're doing. Um, and speaking of which, um, how, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you? Uh, what resources do you have that you would like to share with our listeners? Okay. Um, the best way to connect with me, I, I still, I, I haven't taken it down. I don't think I'm going to, I still have my personal email address on my website, the Alicia Um, and I have a pretty decent following on Instagram where I post other writing, um, you know, just covering the entire human condition, not just about addiction. Everything is the Alicia cook. So my website's the Alicia cook, Instagram's the Alicia cook, Twitter's the Alicia cook. So it's easy to find me. It's easy to Google me if if you wanted to connect with me in some way. Um, resource wise, I'm going to be posting updates about the documentary. And I currently have a book out in the style of a mixtape, um, called stuff I've been feeling lately. And it's not about addiction, but it's dedicated to anyone who, who loves someone battling addiction and all proceeds go to the Willow Tree Center in my home state of New Jersey to help families. Beautiful. I'm going to have all of that listed on the show notes, listeners. So go to the website and uh, check out Alicia's page. And there I will have all that information listed. So perfect. Thank you. 
And Alicia, what is the yes. best suggestion you have ever received? I used to like to plan my life. You know, I thought I'd be married by X age, you know, this job by X age. Um, my mother has this ability to, no matter what's going on in her life, to slow down and appreciate the here and now. You know, wind chimes playing in the wind. She she finds peace in that and looking at the ocean brings her comfort. So um, the best ad- suggestion, I guess, that is from my mother where she told me you can't plan your life. So don't try to <laughs> <laughs> like the here and now. I, I, <laughs> I love it. She always says you can't plan your life as much as you love making your to do list and your pro and con list. You cannot plan your life. So if you think you can, you're just going to end up being disappointed because curveballs come at all times. Man, that is absolutely beautiful. I love it. I want to thank your mother for that. Yeah, she's, hey, Gail. <laughs> she's going to be listening. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Gail. Shout out to Gail. <laughs> and if you could give our newcomers only one suggestion, what would that be? Do everything you can to the best of your ability. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. Alicia, great suggestions, amazing story. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was fun. (laughs) Yes, it was. It was. Very informative, too. So we have now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step fellowship as a whole. And though we discuss 12-step recovery and the impact it had in our lives,